For a thousand years, Westminster Abbey has presented a unique pageant of British history. And tomorrow, the Abbey will be the setting for the state funeral of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. An event on a scale not seen in Britain since the death of the Queen's father, King George VI, 70 years ago in 1952. Her Majesty's body has been lying in state at nearby Westminster Hall for the past four days, where hundreds of thousands of people have filed past the coffin in silence, giving thanks for the longest reigning monarch in British history. Among those keeping vigil in the hall have been the late Queen's grandchildren, including the Prince of Wales and the Duke of Sussex. Well, tonight, that process is far from over. There will be a national one-minute silence at 8 o'clock tonight, while the queues are still stretching over Lambeth Bridge along the south bank of the Thames, as people hope to reach Westminster Hall before the doors close at 6.30 in the morning. Well, tomorrow, the day of the state funeral, will be a public holiday in the United Kingdom, an official day of mourning, both here and throughout the Commonwealth. Ahead of the funeral, world leaders and other distinguished visitors have been arriving in London, some of them paying their respects in person to King Charles and the royal family at a reception in Buckingham Palace earlier today, and then making their way to Westminster Hall to witness the lying in state. She was an incredibly gracious and decent woman. And the thoughts and prayers of the American people are with the people of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth in their grief. It's an incredible privilege to represent the government of New Zealand and to come and pay respects to Her Majesty the Queen. She was a constant in all of our lives. It is with great gratitude that we acknowledge her many decades of service to Aotearoa New Zealand and thank her and her family for everything that she's done for us. We will remember and perpetuate the values she never ceased to embody and promote, the moral fortitude of democracy and freedom. To all of us, in all these years, always stability, confidence. She has shown an immense amount of courage, and therefore, my prayers are with her. Australians give thanks for the life of service of Queen Elizabeth II, a life defined by commitment to family, to country, to Commonwealth. It is a great, great privilege to be able to pay tribute to somebody who valued friendship so valiantly. I so wish eternal peace to her wonderful, generous spirit and, of course, every good wish to King Charles III and all of the people of Britain who have lost a great leader. Від імені усього українського народу висловлюю співчуття королівській родині, усій Великій Британії та країнам співдружності націй. Канада is in mourning. She was one of my favorite people in the world. Mr. Trudeau summing up the theme for lots of the leaders and distinguished uh, visitors who've been into Westminster Hall today. Uh, talking of distinguished visitors, I'm going to introduce my first two guests tonight, uh, India Hicks and Michael Crawford. India, goddaughter to King Charles, which is something that not many people can say, uh, and whose mother was one of the uh, late Queen's ladies-in-waiting. And then we have Michael Crawford, who, of course, is the, uh, well, 
the stellar actor, singer and star of the West End and Broadway. So good to have you with us. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, I'll start by asking you, India, what does tomorrow bring for you and the family? What are the arrangements? What are, what are you doing tomorrow so that viewers can understand what it means for you? Well, it's an enormous privilege to sit here and watch the sun set. And we've just seen another rainbow over that extraordinary thousand-year-old building. So an enormous privilege tonight and an even bigger privilege tomorrow to be coming with my mother um, to attend the funeral here and then to go to Windsor for lunch and to go to the committal service afterwards. It was interesting discussing with my mother earlier in the week how she wanted to be dressed because she's been to a number of these funerals and she was at King George VI funeral. And she remembered very clearly Queen Mary, the Queen Mother and the Queen all in these dark veils, which, of course, my mother was describing hid their deep grief. Mm. Now, of course, in this age, it's not so common to wear those very dark veils. And I suggested to my mother that maybe she didn't wear a veil. It was going to be hard to hear, let's see. Yes. So we, we hopefully, I'm persuading her out of the veil. Well, look, there are some lovely images we have, not of the day of King George's funeral, but actually a much happier day, which was the day of Princess Elizabeth's wedding to the then Prince Philip. Um, and there it is, look. Now, you need to help us here, India. Where's your mum on this one? Because we were all she, struggling. She's on the other side of Prince Philip. Ah, right. Right there at the end. Prince right. Philip was her first cousin, so I, I'm I... guessing she was on his side, but I think that may just be luck. It's a lovely image, isn't it? And it's, a, it's of its time, but it speaks of happiness and, gosh, when you think that that led to, A, a partnership of 73 years between... Um, the Queen and the Duke, obviously, uh, and, of course, the longest reigning monarch in British history. Um, it really was the dawn of a new age at that point, wasn't it, really? Absolutely, and I think what's interesting about that wedding was they were coming out of a time of great austerity after the war, and this was one of the first real events of joy since the war, so incredibly special. So I think she began her... Her whole life was based on these amazing historical milestones. Michael, I'm just thinking that we are reflecting, of course, what millions of people are feeling. Yes. That a great chapter in British history and Commonwealth history has come to an end and will come to a formal end tomorrow. What was your response when you heard the news that the Queen, at the age of 96, had passed away? Well, I was a... I was a ten-year-old choir boy um, at the London Choir School in Bexley in Kent. And we were called out to the tennis courts to be uh, given an announcement. And it, the, it was just very plain and simple. The king is dead. Long live the queen. Mm -hmm. And we were 10. Uh, and and you, uh, the, the first thing you, you do is you go home and, and find out who this lady is going to be. Mm -hmm. And... And I, I bought the comics that I normally took, the Eagle and uh, comic cuts, and, and they were then full of this beautiful young princess. Mm -hmm. And I started a scrapbook. Uh, we didn't have t phones in those days, or it, it, there were plenty of hobbies, and one of them was making scrapbooks. So I started a scrapbook, which I, I have kept to this day. Mm -hmm. And it has taken me uh, really this wonderful lady has taken me through my life. Yes. And so many hundreds of thousands as well. And that's, that's... lovely. The images, by the way, are from Michael's scrapbook, so who, you kindly brought them with you. Um, and I have to say, Michael, you did a very good job of this, didn't uh, the, you? I coloured that one in myself, yes. I'm they're, so sorry. They're, no, they're <laughs> splendid. I'm just thinking that that was the effort you went to then. Yes. And 70 years later, now we're talking about the end of the reign and the start yes. of a new reign. Um, what does it mean to people that the Queen is no longer there? It's, it is so difficult to say because it, it sounds so strange that you say, I felt so close to her. Mm. She was so close to so many with our thoughts. You didn't see, rather like Churchill, you didn't see the engine room. Yeah. You just saw the result. And 
It's a light, nice image of when she presented you with one of your honours. Oh, my yes? CBE, yes. Your CBE, I, well, yes. that's a nice image because there's a nice warmth to it, isn't there? Yes, yes, indeed. She was always so kind and uh, generous. I'm just thinking over your long career. You met her several times. Um, I'm thinking of performances, let's say, at the Royal Variety Performance and other places <laughs> like that. I think we've got a few images of those as well so that you can make a few comments on those and well, what uh, you remember uh, of those encounters. Uh, quite embarrassing. There, there was a comedic... This is the comedic side, so I was, I was playing Frank Spencer uh, in, a, in a few skits with, with Bruce Forsyth, which we had a lot of fun with. And this is... The curtain's going up <laughs> and the Queen is on the right in the royal box. And as, as we went up, I could see in my peripheral vision that her nudge the Duke and, and, and point up in the air, and they were laughing. So I was... It was rather pleasing. It's, it, it's lovely that on the eve of this state funeral, we can talk about a sense of humour and we oh, can talk yes. about a sense of fun, it's... isn't it? Well, I think, I think we, we've... I'm sure we both have stories which demonstrate she did have a great sense of humor, a great wit. Um, actually, my mother again was reminding me about the coronation, that when she went, it was so long, the, the processing in, the actual service, the processing out, that many of the, of the, um, the dukes and duchesses and everybody yeah. came with sandwiches underneath <laughs> their coronets. <laughs> and they would keep them there. And funnily enough, last night when we were watching that Paddington bear sketch, I realized Paddington had done the same thing. Yes. But they all had their sandwiches tucked up in there. And my uncle at the time was a young um, lord and he didn't have the ermine robes that he needed, but he did work in film. So his wife, um, the late Countess Mountbatten Obama, had the brilliant idea that he should go to the film studio and borrow some from the film <laughs> from set. From the wardrobe. So he did, from the wardrobe. <laughs> so he went in fake. Resourceful. Ermine. Very resourceful. Very resourceful. Yes. Just a final word, Michael. What, what, what will you be thinking tomorrow, along with millions of others uh, who will be watching that gun carriage taking that coffin out of London and back to Windsor, what will you be thinking at that point? I, uh, I remember the other day when the car was mm. coming back from Northolt and the outriders were protecting her and getting the car through the traffic and the thousands of people were standing in the middle of the road all races, all ages, just cheering, this, clapping this wonderful woman. Mm. And as we came round Victoria Memorial, uh, the outriders were all gathered in two lines on a curve, these large helmets, and they were all bend, bending their heads forward. And I just... Mm. I burst into tears. <laughs> It was so moving, mm. and I think there are going to be many tears tomorrow. I think you're right, mm. and I think that the event will be on a scale and of a majesty that will impress and touch many people. Yes. Mm. Um, yes. Michael and India, lovely to have you both with us. Thank you um, so much. And lovely company, both of you. Thank you very much indeed. Privilege. Thank you. Well, now, to understand a little bit of the geography, the scale of tomorrow's events, what I thought we'd do is take a look at those processional routes which will be used before and after the state funeral in the Abbey. The first procession, much shorter um, than the other, uh, will take place before the service, just after 10.30 in the morning. And that is when Her Majesty's coffin will be taken from the Houses of Parliament, from Westminster Hall, uh, placed on that Royal Navy state funeral gun carriage, uh, and led by the mass bands of the pipes and drums. It's going to be a magnificent sight and sound across Parliament Square, a long, broad sanctuary to Westminster Abbey for the state funeral service. Now, the second procession is on a much bigger scale. It involves thousands of participants. They will escort the Queen's coffin along Whitehall. Uh, they will leave Westminster Abbey, obviously, and they'll be sent on their way by the Garrison Sergeant Major along to Parliament Square. And then the procession will turn left past the Houses of Parliament for the last time, where the state opening has happened in the Queen's presence so many times, past the Cenotaph and Downing Street. And then turning left into the Horse Guards Arch, and then out onto the vast expanse of Horse Guards Parade, the scene of so many jubilant birthday parades over the years. And then down along the Mall, past uh, St. James's Palace and 
Clarence House on the right, and then the entrance to Green Park just after that, around the Queen Victoria Memorial, which Michael was just referring to in our conversation, and then up Constitution Hill, past Buckingham Palace, to Hyde Park Corner, and to Wellington Arch, uh, which used to be the formal entrance to Buckingham Palace in a different age. Well, it's not anymore. It stands there on Hyde Park Corner. That is where the coffin will be transferred to the state hearse for the journey by road to Windsor. So the early focus tomorrow, understandably, will be on Parliament Square, uh, where that first procession will step off ahead of the service in the Abbey. And my colleague Sophie Rayworth is there. Let's join her now. What an incredible atmosphere here in Parliament Square this evening. There are thousands of people who are coming through the square here just to soak up the atmosphere, parents bringing their children here, really just to, to be a part of the history. Tomorrow, Parliament Square is going to be shut off. No public will be allowed in here. And around here, you can see the engineers, all these flashing lights are getting ready. They're taking up every single traffic light from around here. There were gasps from the crowd a short time ago as the sun set and the Elizabeth Tower was lit up in this extraordinary orange light and suddenly a rainbow appeared over Westminster Hall. And then, of course, there is the queue. The people just keep coming. I ran the length of it this morning from Southwark Park all the way to Westminster and the people I spoke to a short time ago had been queuing for 10 hours to file past the Queen's coffin. There was one man who, who spoke to me and he said he joined the queue as on his own, as an individual, and he left with a family. And I think a lot of people who will have stood all those hours outside and waited to file past the Queen's coffin will will understand that, will understand what he meant by that. Uh, people have been far more emotional as they as they leave than I think they ever expected they would be. Sophie, a very strong theme that we've heard so much, of course, over the past few days. Uh, the detailed plans to be implemented in the event of the monarch's death, including the state funeral, uh, were set out literally decades ago, and they've evolved continuously ever since that time with the Queen's approval. Uh, a major component in those plans, not surprisingly, is the role of the armed forces. And the Queen's unbreakable bond with the forces started when she was just 16, when her father appointed her as Colonel of the Grenadier Guards. And all three branches of the armed forces have been working non-stop to make sure that everything tomorrow goes perfectly to plan. There is a lot of pressure to get it right, and, and that's one of the reasons why when people say the rehearsal seems to take a long time, we want to get it right. So if we have to go over things again and again and again to make sure the day runs correctly, then that's what we'll do. I didn't even have to think twice for such a, an amazing lady. I think she had an impact on everybody. When it comes to pressure, people of the armed forces are fine-tuned in to deal with it and to control those emotions, and that's one of the reasons I think it's great that we always do full dress rehearsals, because it gives you a chance to get that raw emotion out, and then on the day, we just want to do the absolute best for those that are watching. It will be something that I won't just tell my children, but I hope they tell their children. It's an absolute honour and a privilege. The onus really is on the bass drummers to keep time for the band and to play at a volume that the entire Royal Air Force contingent can hear. The aim is we will all be in step from horse guards all the way through up to Wellington Arch. Really proud, my mum keeps telling me how proud she is of me every time I speak to her, so I think they're happy about it. Usually you get a little bit more time in the preparation for these large parades, however, so obviously we've had less time than usual. Uh, so some late nights, uh, early morning rehearsals. So the company at the moment, we've got a number of 17-year-olds that have nearly uh, passed out their training. Uh, they've joined the company uh, and kind of had a baptism of fire in terms of uh, being fired into the Guard of Honour. I've asked them to think about jotting down some of their thoughts because as time goes on, having those notes to refer back to, I think, are a fantastic memory that one can then look back on and say, I took part and, and this is how I felt at the time.
for the Royal Navy, we are privileged to be able to provide uh, approximately a thousand people in terms of uh, ceremonial support in the state gun carriage. It is very emotional. As far as I'm concerned, this is my last duty, uh, you know, to, to Her Majesty the Queen. After 12 hours of marching around with four or five hours working on my kit, like my shoes and my brassos, as soon as I get in my bed, I'm, I'm out, my light's out. Less than a year ago in February, I, I signed my life to the Crown and never did I believe I'd have to do something like this. Shocked that I am on it, but very honoured and thankful that I can do such thing and thank the Queen for her service to the country. Well, that gives you a sense of the pride and the attention to detail. Um, and what goes into an event like tomorrow, which of course is such a rare thing, a uh, state funeral. Uh, it's the first uh, at Westminster Abbey since, we think, 1760, and the funeral of George II. So the stakes are very high, uh, and you need a lot of expertise. And my next two guests are all about that. They're all about perfection and setting the highest standards. I'm pleased to introduce Garrison Sergeant Major Andrew Stokes, known to uh, most of his friends as Vern, uh, and uh, he's responsible for planning uh, and the delivery of state ceremonial events. It's a huge responsibility. And we have uh, Major Lauren Patritz Watts, who's Director of Music, the Band of the Welsh Guards, and uh, proudly displaying the, the Welsh Guards plume there as well. So it's good to have you with us. Thank you both. Um, can I start then, Vern, with you and ask you, um, you know, you're a modest man, but I'm just just signalling to viewers that you've carried a huge burden of responsibility over the past 10 days and indeed before then with the planning. Um, what can people expect tomorrow in terms of this scale and the spectacle itself? Well, I think, Hugh, it's a scale that um, we haven't seen for 70 years, so it's unprecedented in, in most of our lifetimes. Uh, and you'll see the armed forces who are ordinary people that consistently do extraordinary things, uh, deliver on behalf of the nation um, Her Majesty's final journey, uh, delivered to the best of their ability as a final thank you, really, uh, not just from the armed forces, but from the nation. And, and what we've tried to deliver, what we're going to deliver, and we've, we've tried this week to, to make sure, is that it's, it's absolutely perfect. We've got 5,000 ceremonial troops tomorrow. They are all dedicated. They don't need any motivation. Um, they want to do the best of their ability, um, and they will do. And it's, it's very complicated, but they all understand the plan, and they're all willing to deliver, uh, and they want to do the absolute best they can do. Well, we've already seen some of the standards that you set, because um, we've seen some processions already, including the procession uh, from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall. And there we can see you, Vern, you're following the, uh, the coffin and the imperial state crown there in the procession itself, a very prominent role. Uh, you say people don't need motivation, which um, everyone in the armed forces would, would agree with. And yet the pressure's immense, isn't it, when it comes to an event on this scale with the eyes of the world on what's going on? The pressure is immense, Hugh, because uh, there's so many people taking part. Um, everybody needs to be briefed and rehearsed. And that's not just the military, it's, it's members of the household, it's senior officers, it, indeed it's members of the public that will take part in, in the procession as well. Um, and it, it's also the services, there's two incredible services tomorrow, a funeral service in Westminster Abbey and one in St George's Chapel. All of that is choreographed and needs rehearsed. Um, so it's, it, it, there's a lot of pressure, but we're set and we will deliver on behalf of the Queen. And you're part of the delivery, Lauren, because the music will be an absolutely vital part of the success of the event. And when I say success, I mean for the event to deliver all the emotion, the intensity, the correct tribute to Her Majesty. How do you see the role of the music and the way that you'll be playing a part tomorrow? Yeah, so the music is a key part of the parade. And I think um, it just allows everyone part of the parade, audience, wherever they are, here in London, watching around the world. The music is one of the parts that will unite everyone. Um, you know, that transcends any language. It brings everyone together. It's 
Um, you know, the programme has been carefully chosen, obviously, by Her mm. Majesty herself. Um, it's part of the planning. So when they hear those funeral marches, they will have already heard them before. Most people around the world will recognise them. Um, they're absolutely picked for the occasion and the event. Uh, viewers will certainly want me to congratulate you, given the fact that you've broken a mould. Um, you're director of music, the Welsh Guards. Yeah. Um, you're the first woman in that role. Um, are you the first woman to be in charge of a band in the household division? Um, yeah, so in the Five Foot Guards band. Well, that's, and, uh, an, uh, that's an incredible achievement as well. So, so congratulations on that. What's the preparation been like? I mean, what kind of time frame have you had to get this ready? Yeah, so I, I think in, on one hand, um, when you're in state ceremonial, you are performing to the public all of the time. So in, in some way, you are partly match fit. Of course, an event of this scale, you can't replicate. Um, and so it has been intense. Uh, and certainly, preparation started uh, on Friday for the planning. Um, but the music has been rehearsed sort of biannually or um, every six months discreetly, just to make sure yeah. that bands know the music. And we are not there trying to learn the music this week. We know the music, mm. we know the parts. So our focus has really been on working with the troops that we're marching with, some of those people who won't have marched with a band mm. very often. And so really our role this week has been about giving them confidence that the music is going to lift them mm. through the parade and through the procession, rather. So, um, it's and as I understand it, your husband, as a role in Windsor? <laughs> yeah, so um, he's in the Household Cavalry Band. Right. So okay. he will be in, in Windsor um, performing there. Um, we wish you well. And uh, Vern, thanks for coming in. Um, and Lauren, good, good luck to you as well. You. Um, we'll be looking forward to just admiring what you do tomorrow. So um, good luck to you. Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you both. Well, there have been quite a few familiar faces in the queue for that lying in state at Westminster Hall. Uh, we did, of course, see a certain David Beckham there on Friday. He was widely praised for having queued for hours and hours, not jumping the queue because he's a superstar VIP. No, he was in the queue for many hours um, and good for him. And of course, then you have Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, his office in Lambeth Palace, just across the bridge there. Uh, and he went over to chat with lots of people who were waiting their turn. Now, the Archbishop will be a key figure at tomorrow's funeral. The service, in fact, will be led by the Dean of Westminster with the Archbishop at his side. And I caught up with Justin Welby a little earlier. I asked him what people could expect in today, tomorrow's service. A service is a number of building blocks. One of the key building blocks is this is a funeral of a human being with, an, with a close family who are grieving. And so I... I hope and pray that we can expect something that enables them to find a measure of comfort amidst the glare of publicity. But second, this is a funeral of a, the longest serving head of state in the world and yeah. that we've ever had. So you can expect a great deal of grandeur and pomp. The third building block is probably the most important in the readings and the prayers, it will be something that, again, I pray will fit the Queen's character and person. You'll think not just this was a service fit for a Queen, this was a service fit for this person. When we talk about her faith, how did that manifest itself in a practical way? Prayer which is what you'd expect. I, I was very moved earlier this year. I <clears throat> very carelessly got pneumonia and COVID and, and was sitting there feeling vaguely sorry for myself at home. And uh, a note came from the private secretary to the Queen saying the Queen asks me to say that she's praying for you. I was quite overwhelmed. I mean, she's got rather more important things to pray for, frankly, but I've heard that story again and again from loads of people. She was someone who prayed. There is the public face that the world knows. And then, of course, there is the private individual. What light can you shine on that aspect of the Queen? I think the first word I'd use is wisdom. Wisdom means the capacity to know what to do that is right in difficult circumstances. I've 
found myself, and uh, I found from listening to others who saw her regularly, uh, particularly prime ministers, she would so often recall an absolutely perfect parallel to the situation they were facing, often with a little touch of humour. I remember one of them saying, oh, I'm really concerned about this, and the Queen said, oh, yes, that rather reminds me of a problem that Winston Churchill faced. <laughs> and he, <laughs> yes, it was, yeah. But it was done so nicely. Yeah. yeah. 70 years of memory of the most complex and difficult situations has given her wisdom to an extraordinary degree. When that funeral ends, and then the procession begins, mm. what do you want people to be taking from that service? I long for people to come away with a sense that what came from the Queen's faith in God gave her a richness of life that overflowed to those around her. And I hope people and pray that people can feel bound together more, that there is a sense of belonging to one another, that this is the richness, the wonder of our heritage in this country. Archbishop, on that positive note, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hugh. Such a pleasure to talk to uh, Justin Welby there. Um, in Lambeth Palace, just across the river from where we are here at uh, Westminster. Now, tomorrow's events happen in two sequences. Uh, the first here in central London and the second uh, in the royal town of Windsor, where that final committal service will take place at St George's Chapel within the walls of the Queen's principal home of Windsor Castle. Uh, let's join my colleague Kirsty Young, who's there. Yeah, who's there. Thanks, you. Yes, Windsor will be home as you say, to the final stage of this momentous 11 days. This is a town and a castle that's, of course, steeped in royal history, but tomorrow promises to be really a day like no other, the final goodbye to the Queen. Her coffin will make its way through the streets of this famous Berkshire town, down the long walk, which runs at over two and a half miles, and we expect that tomorrow it's likely that it will be packed with people on either side paying their final respects to the Queen. Well, then the cortege will slowly process to St George's Chapel. It sits in the darkness now behind me where the King and the rest of the royal family will have gathered for the committal service. Interestingly, also in the chapel will be the Queen's closest friends and confidants, the people, well, the people she relaxed with during the times that she wasn't travelling the globe or attending to matters of state. They'll be gathered to hear a service led by the Dean of Windsor and to say their final goodbye to a woman who was not just their queen, but also their dear friend. So tomorrow here at Windsor, it will be a moment in history that we witness, but also for so many in St George's Chapel, an intensely personal goodbye. And David Dimbleby will be commentating on the event and I'll be here with some wonderful guests to hear their thoughts about the day, the final service, and all the scenes around us as they unfold. For now, let's go to the long walk and let's join Anita Rani. Yes, Kirsty, I am on the long walk and behind me is the Cambridge Gate where thousands of people have been arriving all week to pay their last respects. I took a wander up there and had a look at some of the very moving and personal messages that people have left for the royal family. The atmosphere here is incredibly calm and reflective. We had a perfect sunset over Windsor. And as you can see, even though it's dark, thousands of people are still filtering up to the Cambridge Gate to pay their last respects. And some people have arrived for the duration. I met one family who traveled down from Bedfordshire and uh, they have found their spot. They'll be spending the night under the stars tonight because tomorrow thousands of people will be lining the long walk to say goodbye to the Queen as she makes her final journey. And of course, for the people of Windsor, she was so much more than simply Her Majesty the Queen. She was a familiar neighbour of this town. Well, here in the studio now, to tell us what the Queen has meant to her over the decades is Dame Mary Berry. Thank you so much for taking the time, Dame Mary. It's lovely to see you. Um, 
can I ask you just to, to rewind 10 days ago and tell me where, where you were when you heard this news? I was in the kitchen. Where? And I immediately went and grabbed a chair. And I thought, only a couple of days ago, our Queen was welcoming our new Prime Minister. And I just wonder whether she knew that she was just fading then. But she was as bright and as beautiful, and that huge smile on yes. that occasion. And then just two days later, she was no longer here. Well, it was she was gone moment. to join Philip. Tell me then, um, I mean, everybody feels somehow that they know the Queen, but actually, in reality, very few of us have met the Queen. She did her best. She met a lot of people. You have met the Queen. I mean, what were the circumstances that you met the Queen? Well, uh, the phone rang uh, and it was from the palace and I immediately thought it was my son or friends of his mucking about. Uh, and anyway, I listened and they said the Queen would like you to come and have lunch. And they gave me a date and I looked in my diary and I said, I'm really, really sorry. I promised to do a demonstration at Earlham Hall uh, in Lincolnshire. And the you didn't turn down, <laughs> you turned no, down I the did, Queen. because, right. you know, if you you've a got 100 people or whatever, all have got their tickets. And I said, I'm really, really sorry. I've promised to do it. That's the way I am. That is the and, way you are, exactly. yes. And anyway, I put the phone down and I thought, oh, dear. And the phone rang again and, could I give you another date? Yes, you can. And um, so I was very thrilled. Um, and we, uh, I had an invitation for another date. And I was, first of all, I thought, what am I going to wear? And I thought, it said a day dress. So I, well, ha I had a new dress and I wanted it to be plain because I had a brooch that my mother had just dyed. And I thought my mother, like me, loved our queen and admired her. And so um, I, I then went to the palace at and uh, it was just so exciting to actually see the Queen. I had no idea she was so little and beautiful. And then the lunch, um, there was a big oval table. And, you know, in our house, uh, 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 my husband's one end, uh, like in most houses, was oval. And um, I'm at the other end. Yeah. But the Queen and Prince Philip sat in the middle so they could talk either side. Clever. At uh, 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 the guests. And the corgis were there. And they were running around the table, and you could see that the Queen was quite smiley and joyful and looking down and having a chat. And at the end of the meal, um, she opened a little silver box, and there were little treats for them. And she quietly went on talking and sort of <laughs> handing them down, and then they were taken off, and it was all peaceful again. Beautiful memories. Well, what are your memories, if you have them? of the Queen as a young woman. Do you remember seeing her for the first time? I, she was just 25, of course. I remember uh, seeing her because we'd... Uh, I remember her, the pictures of her coming mm. down the steps. And she was, so, of course, so young and so beautiful. And uh, Prince Philip was behind her. And I wonder what she thought was ahead. But she was composed and came down. I think Churchill met her. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's right she returned it? from South Africa. And yes. I just thought then um, all the things that she'd been prepared for. You know, she'd been a, gu a girl guide like me, and you learn a lot in the girl guides. And um, she, she was ready for the job, and she's been loyal ever since. This is a big question. I don't know if it's a fair question, but what do you think her legacy will be to, to the world, the United Kingdom, what do you think she leaves behind? Um, I think that she has given us a great example to follow. Um, uh, for everybody in the UK, um, she's put her family first. Um, she's uh, thought of the country and has continued with her religious faith. And she's set us such an example. And whatever situation she's in, there's that huge smile. And she always looks so lovely in, in a bold, usually a bold, bright colour. And um, she doesn't sort of follow fashion. She just has great style. Lovely Had memories. great style. Yes. It's difficult, that one, using the past tense. But thank you so much for sharing your memories and your thoughts on the Queen, Dame Mary Berry. Now, back to you. Kirsty, many thanks, and uh, thanks to Mary as well. well. As we mentioned earlier, members of the public will have until 6.30 tomorrow morning to file past the Queen's coffin at Westminster Hall. And all day, 
they've been emerging from the hall after that very long wait, and then they have their short time in there, um, saying that the long wait was worth it in every sense, uh, with a real notion of having been witness to history. So let's join my colleague Sophie once again in Parliament Square. I've got three people who uh, queued for 11 hours and definitely think it was worth it. Tracy, Lara, Renee, what was it like, first of all, in that queue? Well, we made some fabulous friends in the queue. So the, the 11 hours went really quickly. So, um, you know, it was tough going. You know, it's tiring. Um, few, few toilet trips, but, you know, it's definitely worth the wait. Definitely worth it. And you're with your daughter, Lara, here. Why did you want to come, Lara? I've always loved the Royals. I like. I grew up watching them on TV, and I actually sent the Queen Christmas cards every year, and I get responses back as well. So I just wanted to come and pay my respects and say thank you. And Renee, you didn't know these two, mother and daughter. You've only just met them, but firm friends already. Yeah, um, I queued up by myself, and I thought that it would be very uh, long and tedious, but with amazing people that I found on the queue, um, it made the time flew by really quickly. And once you get inside Westminster Hall, you're in there for such a short time, aren't you? Only a few minutes. What was it like? Well, um, I did actually watch it beforehand on the, um, the live that you can see to sort of like get an, an image of what it was going to be like but when you go in there it's it's just so surreal you know it's, it's so quiet um, respectful and you know it, it's just very difficult to explain what it was like but it was, it's lovely to be in there a lot of people talk about the the moment that we can't see on television which is actually when you're just about to leave and everybody turns back has their last look don't they yeah so when everyone you don't see on camera but everyone turns around and they will just take one final look and they're trying to like savour the moment and be like saying thank you and everything. And as people come out here and the gates at Westminster Hall, people are really emotional, aren't they? A lot of people bursting into tears. How did you feel as you left? I felt it was very moving. I felt like I just wanted to go back and just savour the last minutes that I can see the Queen for the last time and just um, take it all in. Because you're from the Philippines, you've been here for three years, haven't you? Why, why was it so important for you to be here? I think the Queen is just amazing. Uh, she's very well known and even living in Asia, she's the Queen that everybody knows and um, I just felt like I needed to see her one last time and give me respects. Yeah. So what I want to know is how are all your feet? Are you alright? <laughs> well, considering I'm the oldest one here, my feet are really tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine definitely hurt too. Oh, it's numb. Definitely numb. <laughs> well, amazing. What an effort. What an amazing thing to have done. And uh, I hope you all get some rest now. And uh, I know you're, you're not going to be here tomorrow. You're going to go home and watch it on television. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. thank you very much for describing what it was like for you all. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. They can uh, rest the feet, certainly. Well, two special guests with me now who certainly will be here tomorrow because they've been invited to the state funeral. Uh, Mark Donaldson, who is an Australian soldier who was awarded the Victoria Cross back in 2009 for bravery in Afghanistan. And then we have Dominic Trulan, who was awarded the George Cross for his part in helping civilians during a terrorist attack in Kenya. So both of them uh, with a very distinguished record, both of them, happily with us tonight and thank you for coming in. Um, Mark, first of all, your experience then of meeting Her Majesty, first of all, and your impressions. And we can see, I think, the moment when you met Her Majesty because you'd received your award out in Australia. So you met the Queen um, and that's it. That's a lovely image, isn't it? Tell us about it. Yeah, sure. So to you, the first thing I remember is uh, hearing the corgis coming down the hallway. Uh, and that was really the first indication that uh, you know, Her Majesty was on the way and it was all about to happen for me to walk through the doors and, and meet her. It was a very special occasion for me and, and uh, extremely honoured to be able to do that, being the first Victoria Cross for Australia in 40 years. So yeah. uh, it was rather rather uh, special and you know, she, was, she was very, very lovely, very natural and made me feel at ease. And you know, the, the conversation was very free-flowing. Free she wanted to know about home, the family and what it was like back in Australia and then that shifted through to Afghanistan and the people. And I think that really shows and, and brings out her sense of humanity and her real caring for the world, no matter what part of it it was. Um, and, you know, it was just, just really lovely and nice to be in there. And as the conversation continued, uh, I got to see a little bit more of, of Her Majesty and, and what a lot of people have been speaking about over the last few days was her humour. That's nice. And, and we went towards the window and uh, she, she shared a little joke about 
how often people say to her how strange it was that she built a castle so close to an airport. So, it's, uh, you know. Talking about Windsor, obviously, yes. Correct. Yes, well, it is on the flight path, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we're just here, this magnificent view that we have, um, gentlemen of Westminster Abbey, it's, it's a bit unreal, isn't it, to look at it in this kind of light. Um, You've taken part in the service, Mark, before mm. in the Abbey. Tell us about that. Yeah, it was a huge honour again. It was uh, Remembrance Day uh, 2009, and I was with Johnson Bahari VC, the British VC, and uh, I had the honour of, of laying a wreath that uh, Her Majesty, uh, as you can see from the images, you uh, placed the card on, and we got to lay it down. And again, you know, with all the unknown soldiers across the Commonwealth, and and how important that is to all service personnel, and uh, it was just a tremendous <coughs> honour, um, you know. Mm really representing the nation yeah. uh, and, and representing the Commonwealth in, in general. It's a very nice thing to reflect on. Mm. Uh, Dominic, tell us about your experience. Um, the George Cross, of course, named after the Queen's own father, um, which in itself is a very strong bond with the monarch who's now left us. What was your experience of meeting the Queen? I think the first thing that strikes you is, you know, her, her ability to speak to anybody and just make you feel relaxed. Mm. Um, she made a comment um, when I met her in Buckingham Palace um, for a reception about me having her gallantry medal, the Queen's gallantry medal, and her father's George Cross, as you've just said. But I think, really, the, the way that this has all come together and the planning and the operational effect, as we would say, um, of the whole funeral and everything that's going on and it is the end of of her reign mm. it's the start of the next mm. generation mm. um you know king charles but i think that actually to show the magnitude of the influence that um her majesty had is the hundreds of thousands of people that have queued up and been through and i speak for myself and i'm sure mark and other guys in the vc and gc association is there's going to be hundreds of people in that beautiful building tomorrow and they're going to represent the whole world and that is her majesty you know she did as much as she was you know the uk as much as she was the commonwealth actually she is probably the most influential person female in the world that we've seen and she made a promise 70 years ago I've taken the oath, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And, uh, you know, and I think she respected us of soldiers uh, uh, and taking the oath. And she um, made that promise 70 years ago, an unfaltering dedication service um, and a real bond with the, the military. I think the bond of the military is unquestionable, uh, unbreakable. Um, and yet those qualities that you just mentioned uh, service, lifelong service, uh, dedication to duty, uh, never wavering in that. Those are qualities which are appreciated clearly beyond the armed services. People in all walks of life have appreciated um, the service that she gave. So it's a pretty universal thing that people are admiring. Definitely, mm. definitely. And, and, and admiring it, um, and people have travelled all over the world to come to, to go and pass laying in state and uh, you know I, I think the influence that she's done as our queen the queen of the world and I think that people look at that with huge respect um, and her ability to defuse things her forgiveness her own religion her strength of um, service and her strength of of dedication you know she her forgiveness of people uh, and that sort of thing I think is just unbreakable well, uh, I wish we had more time to talk, gentlemen, but uh, the clock is against us, as usual. But I hope today goes... Uh, today, obviously, has been a pleasure to meet you. Hope tomorrow goes well for you both as you take part in the, uh, in the service there. But Mark and Dominic, thank you very much. Good to meet you both. More thank than you. welcome. Thank you. Well, on his accession last week, King Charles specifically mentioned his wife Camilla, her vital role as Queen Consort, in supporting him as he takes on the burdens of the throne. It was the Queen who declared a few years ago uh, that her personal wish was for the then Duchess of Cornwall to become Queen Consort when Charles became King. She has been part of our lives forever. I'm 75 now and I, I can't remember anybody except the Queen being there. It must have been so difficult for her, being a solitary woman, 
there weren't women prime ministers or women presidents. Um, she was the only one, so I think she carved her own role. She made a rule that she had her private time and her private passions and then her public role, and I think that is very important that, you know, the diary is planned out so you know when you're on duty and when you've got to do things. And then when she went up to Scotland in August, you know, that was the moment where it was her enjoyment. Although she was probably working, you know, with her red boxes throughout. She could have her family to stay, she could do the things she loved. Her real passion was racing. She was able to escape to Sandringham. She had to stud next door. She could go every day, see her foals, work out, you know, the next meetings for the year. I think she always kept that as, you know, her, her private bit. You wouldn't dare question her or argue with her on how a horse had bred or how it ran, because you'd get a very steely, blue-eyed look back again. I remember coming from here, Clarence House, go to Windsor the day I got married. Um, when I probably wasn't firing on all six cylinders, quite nervous. And for some unknown reason, I put on a pair of shoes and one had an inch heel and one had a two inch heel. So, I mean, it took about hop along and there's nothing I could do. It's halfway down in the car before I realised. Uh, and, you know, she, she could see it. She laughed about it and said, look, I'm terribly sorry. And she did, you know, she had a, a, a good sense of humour. Is there something that is more unusual? <laughs> <laughs> I've taken her to some of my charities and uh, to the Ebony Horse Club and to the medical detection dogs. And uh, she loved both of them. You know, it was real sort of genuine enjoyment and, and she asked lots of questions. And it was very nice to take her to things which I, I knew she would enjoy. She's got those wonderful blue eyes that when she smiles, you know, they light up her whole face. I'll always remember that smile, you know, that smile is unforgettable. Lovely tribute there from the uh, Queen Consort and, of course, just reflecting on the fact that um, uh, it was Her Majesty's wish that uh, Camilla become the Queen Consort uh, when Charles acceded to the throne. So from that moment on, there was no question about the transition. The Queen set her blessing on that and... Um, there were no questions after that, as, as you'd expect. Uh, it was one of the things that had been planned and discussed in some detail, um, and it was done very deliberately and carefully, as you'd expect. Uh, talking about deliberately and carefully, I have the master of the Queen's music, now master of the King's music, Judith Weir with me. Thank you very much. Distinguished composer and musician. Uh, and Charles Cooper's with me as well, representing a different part of music and entertainment. Charles, um, chairman of the Royal Variety Charity, came across Her Majesty in so many different ways, especially with the Royal Variety performance. So lovely to have you both with us. Thank you so much. Um, Judith, first of all, can we talk about the Queen's love of music and how you would describe it? I mean, was it fairly eclectic? Was it fairly broad? Was it, I mean, how would you describe the Queen's taste in music? In my experience, she was a person who had a lot of music in her life. Uh, she had had a very good musical upbringing, piano lessons, used to sing uh, and amateur theatricals when she was young. But of course, in her mature life, she was surrounded by music. Mm -hmm. She really admired those wonderful military bands. She loved the bands. And, uh, Here she is shaking your hand there. That was in 2014? It is. When I'm, you were appointed? Indeed, that's, that's quite right. That's a lovely image. Indeed. She's a broad smile. As you were saying, noticed at the birthday parade, um, many times the Queen would be tapping away to the, yes. to the band music. So she clearly liked that. I, what, what else in terms of music did well, she like? she was as we all know, a committed churchgoer and, of yeah. course, head of the English yeah. church. She went every week at least to church and she and her husband really listened to that beautiful Anglican music yeah. and uh, could really differentiate between yeah. it. That's interesting. I I'm just wondering whether really her musical tastes, some people might assume, were, you know, fairly constrained in terms of the classical tradition, the Anglican tradition, 
Um, are you saying that she didn't stray too far from that? Because I'm just coming to Giles in a second, and she'll have heard lots of different music at the Royal Variety performance. So uh, is that how you describe it? I would say also, of course, she was a young person in the 40s yes. and would have heard a yeah. lot of great show music and, yes. and singers of yes. that time. Um, well, Giles, you could give us a different perspective or maybe a shared perspective. Um, and as we do that, I just want to just show maybe one of the images that we have um, of the uh, experience that Giles has had. There you are on the on the right. And this is at the this is at the Royal Variety Performance, obviously. Yes, it is. Yeah, 2012. Um, tell us a little about your interaction with Her Majesty. Well, I, I think it's, she was very generational in terms of taste, you know, you know and you touched slightly there on, on uh, musicals, but theatre was her great love, and particularly musicals. So of, of that generation, in a way, Showboat, Annie Gets Your Gun, Oklahoma. Yeah. yeah. I think in terms of um, songs, I mean, there's no secret that she loved Vera Lynn, um, yeah. White Cliffs of Dover, uh, Fred Astaire, Cheek to Cheek, um, but also in more sort of recent times, um, Gary Barlow and Andrew Lloyd Webber's song Sing mm -hmm. with the Commonwealth Band and a Military Wives Choir. Mm -hmm. She was also known as a, as a, in her younger days, as a great dancer. She, oh. she had great rhythm. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Um, I'm bound to play in one clip, Giles, and I'd love your view on this because this made us all smile when we saw this. Here we are. Talk us through this one. That's the Queen meeting Lady Gaga yes. in Blackpool in 2009. Um, a great year. And the Queen always would like to visit the regions. Mm. And so uh, for many years, we alternated going to a city outside London. Um, this is in Blackpool. So we went to Manchester, yeah. Liverpool, Edinburgh. And that was a great day, meeting yeah. Lady Gaga. And it supported, it supported local theatre in the way that she was supporting the charity. Um, and of course, how often would Lady Gaga or Bette Midler as well on that show yeah. go to Blackpool? And it was a great way of her showing support for the regions. We talk a lot about the importance of music. Clearly, we've talked already with one of the directors of music of the bands tomorrow and talked about the importance of music during the day, not just in the service, but before and after the service. Um, and, of course, that the Queen would have a view on um, what might have been chosen and what the, the correct mix would be. Um, how assertive was she in... Um, expressing a view on whether she liked a bit of music or not, in your experience? I don't remember particularly being assertive about pieces of music, but she was very clear about good or bad performances and whether people had done well or not. And I think that's why a good word from her was well worth having. Well, a good word, of course, and that can take place, I mean, I imagine, you'd have been in quite a privileged position, I'd thought, uh, Charles, in the sense that after a performance of you know, good performances by very big names at the Royal Variety. She may well have expressed a, a view one way or another on performance. I mean, it's, it's just human nature, isn't it? It is, although she was very careful about what yeah. she said, because obviously if you say something good about somebody, well, what about the others? And so yes. she, she was yeah. very tactful. Mm. But um, it was great to always see the, the look on the faces of every performer, whether they be legends from the past or new, uh, new performers. She meant so much to the entertainment industry. It's that support, really, which yeah. lots of people, friends of mine who are in the uh, in the business, yeah. um, basically saying what a great sponsor she was, what a great supporter she was. Yes. Um, there'll be all kinds of people watching now with lots of different interests. We're just going to pause a second, if we may, because the time is approaching 8 o'clock. Um, there is to be a one-minute silence um, where the public are invited to come together and to observe a national moment of reflection, uh, to mourn, uh, to reflect, and indeed to give thanks uh, for the life of Queen Elizabeth II and to think about the legacy as well. And to observe this silence tonight on the eve of the state funeral, to look ahead, if you like, and be ready uh, to share in the experience across the nation tomorrow.
So the one-minute silence has been observed on the eve of the state funeral for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. And uh, across Britain, as we saw there, people eager to show their respect and indeed to think about what tomorrow represents. And uh, Judith and Giles are still with me for a final thought as we look ahead to tomorrow. What will tomorrow mean to people, Judith, do you think? What will tomorrow as a, as a day of remembering and giving thanks? Will it touch millions of people, as some people predict it will? What, what are your thoughts? I would very much think that it will. It will be a beautiful day. We will see all the really most wonderful things that can happen in music and uh, in a wonderful abbey. And I think also a, an important moment for us to really realize that we will not be seeing the Queen again. She won't pop up as she so often did, even in the last year, doing some delightful thing, cutting a cake at mm. the WI or something. She, she has died. And this is our real realty moment. Yeah, I think it will dawn on people tomorrow that the world has changed, Giles. I think it will. And um, whilst being very emotional, and very respectful. I think also it will be, in many ways, the greatest show on earth, you know, with the military bands and the parades. Us Brits put on a good show and um, that will be seen around the world and I, hopefully we'll all do her proud. Um, I may also say, Hugh, what an amazing job you and everyone at the BBC has done over the last 10 days. Well, Absolutely fantastic. Um, we're doing our job. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, it's good to have you both with us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much, Judith and uh, Charles. Thanks very much for your company. Okay. Well, our coverage of the state funeral of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II will begin tomorrow on BBC One. Uh, join us at two minutes to eight in the morning. Why that time? Well, it's just ahead of the opening of the doors of Westminster Abbey at eight o'clock in the morning. So we're coming on a couple of minutes before eight. Uh, we'll be covering the solemn pageantry of the day, of course, here and in Windsor. So join us then in the morning, two minutes to eight. Thanks to all of our guests, but from all of the BBC teams in Westminster and in Windsor, thank you for watching and good night. <laughs>